So Andre and I are going to explain a little bit the work that we started at the Sandbox in London and that will hopefully carry on during the upcoming months. Even though we do not foresee yet a publication in the near future, we still believe that the path that we drafted back then in the sandbox uh, may lead to some interesting research. Our presentation is entitled uh, Demystifying DDSP. DDSP is this library for differentiable signal processing for audio synthesis with neural networks that was recently published by Google and that has drawn a lot of attention. And so by now, many of you might be familiar. I won't go into much detail, but uh, we find it important to explain why this library was so necessary. One of the main challenges in audio synthesis with neural networks is to find the, the appropriate representations to fit to our network. But also we can picture it the other way around, find the architecture that we learn more efficiently from a specific form of data. This interplay between the way we structure the audio information and how this structure aligns with the architecture building blocks is key for the efficient learning of the network. From the architecture side, for instance, our neural network toolbox provides us with tools that extract very specific types of features from the data. For example, CNNs look for local patterns and other types of layers like LSTMs or RNNs enable learning more sequential dependencies of our data. But these blocks introduce some bias towards find looking for these patterns in our, in our data. In the same way, from the audio representation side, uh, the most common ones in the literature are the raw audio waveform or the magnitude and phase of the short-time Fourier transform. But even though these representations allow approximating uh, almost any signal, they are not exempt from bias. Uh, for example, uh, the alignment of the waveform across the different frames, in the case of strided convolutional models of raw audio, or the spectral leakage problem found in the case of models that work with time frequency, time frequency representations hamper the capacity to learn of the neural network because ultimate, ultimately these problems lead the model to learn unnecessarily many filters to approximate the audio signal, which is clearly inefficient. A workaround for this has been to train the model uh, to generate pre-extracted synthesis parameters instead of the audio waveform directly or time frequency pins. This process involves taking the synthesizer, fine-tuning its parameter to better synthesize some target audio dataset, and then use these parameters as the target in our neural network. Even though this approach uh, has led to very high quality neural audio synthesis, such as the case of the work of uh, Jordi Bonada from the MTG on the vocoder with neural networks, on a neural network control vocoder, the results still lack expressiveness uh, due to the process of fine-tuning the, the synthesizer, which is error-prone. And this is where DDSP comes into play. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. R yeah. It is a Python library uh, that extends our neural network toolbox by offering signal processing blocks found in typical synthesizers, such as harmonic uh, oscillators, filters, noise generators, etc., etc., that use differentiable operations. This way, we can build our synthesis patch, put it uh, into the neural network, and perform gradient descent and backpropagate the reconstruction error from the target audio waveform all, all the way to the, to the input of the neural network. So the takeaway message and the main benefits of these differentiable DSP blocks are that the network doesn't need to deal anymore with the intrinsic biases derived from having to learn from frame raw audio. Uh, this makes the learning more efficient because it reduces the need for very deep models. And finally, it enables the interpretation of the learned parameters. Uh, in the following slides, uh, André will, uh, will enumerate uh, some of our sandbox achievements and will introduce the simple autoencoder that we will use as proof of concept. Oh, thank you. So uh, our goal in the sandbox was basically to have a look at the framework and uh, uh, learn how to use it and see if and how we can apply it to our projects because we are both working on something related to uh, conditional music generation. And the first achievement uh, was actually installing the library, which uh, was a super uh, smooth process uh, as soon as we figured out how to do it correctly. And then running the code uh, itself was a piece of cake because it's written by Google. So of course it doesn't have any bugs. Uh, so this uh, took up only most of the first day, and then we were finally ready to start training our own models and doing some preliminary experiments. 
So the, we were using the model presented in the DDSP paper, which looks like this, it's an auto encoder. So the input is some monophonic audio and it is trained to produce the same audio uh, on the output. You can see that uh, we have the neural part here on the left and the yellow DSP part on the right. So these are some digital signal processors that form a simple modulus synthesizer. And these, uh, the parameters of those uh, digital processors are controlled by the neural network. The network itself consists of an encoder and a decoder. And the interesting thing is that the inputs to the decoder are actually some uh, meaningful features. So they are pitch, loudness, and then some, uh, some residual features called Z, which are mostly related to timbre. So this gives us some kind of control over the generation. And the, the authors have a very, very nice demo where they show that they can train the model on uh, one instrument, uh, like violin, and then they input human singing and uh, the model basically performs timbre transfer and makes the singing sound like violin and uh, with, with very good sound quality. So uh, inspired by this, one of our first ideas to try was to train this model on multiple uh, different uh, instruments, monophonic instruments, and then perform timbre transfer just by uh, swapping this, these Z features, which is not uh, as simple as it might sound because uh, actually these features uh, are not necessarily independent of the other features, pitch and loudness. So, because there is simply no, no magic feature disentanglement happening behind. Uh, so, hey, we don't generally get independent control of timbre, unfortunately. Uh, and the way they actually achieve timbre transfer in the paper is by uh, not using these residual features at all, only training the model on one instrument. And actually the encoder uh, also is just a pre-trained pitch tracker. So then the model is not really an autoencoder anymore, but it's just the just a trainable uh, synthesizer whose inputs are uh, pitch and loudness. And this this is how they uh, achieve the amazing results. So unfortunately, our our idea didn't uh, didn't really fly, but we were still able to investigate the uh, synthesis capabilities of this model. And well, our results are uh, just. Uh, bunch of sound examples which I'm going to play. So we have uh, we have trained uh, one model on bass. Uh, this is the decoder only model which I which I uh, showed uh, just now. So uh, we can we can input uh, some bass signal into the model like this. Hopefully you can hear it. And then uh, the model is going to reconstruct uh, We're having see. problems with the distortion. I don't know why. Uh, we, it's it's done. It's not sounding correctly. It's the same as. Uh, okay. Okay, well, I'm done. It's the same problem from the right. from the other's presentation. Okay, I'm not sure how I can fix this. Probably I cannot fix this at the moment. So. Can you play through the speakers and just? Uh, uh, well, I don't know. Well, yeah, I can try that. Uh, well, but I, have, I would have to stop the audio. Well, it's fine. Then go on. I mean, let's let's see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Probably it won't work. So. You can hear, but it's distorted. Okay. Javier, maybe you can play the sound examples if you have them. Uh, the thing is that I'm not uh, sharing the audio, it's on direct. So then you, uh, yeah, you, I would have to stop sharing? No, you, you, without sharing the audio, you could play through the, the loudspeakers, Javier. Uh, yeah, okay, true. yeah, one second. I have to go to the, because I don't, one second here. So, Honesty. All right, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so this is the first base model input. All right. And this is the reconstruction.
This is the input of electric base. Uh, I don't know why this one doesn't play. Need to play. This was actually the reconstruction of the input electric base. I don't know why this is going bananas. And now this is the input uh, with the other model that was trained on sax and trombone. This is the input. And this is the reconstruction. Yeah, yeah. So, so what we did, uh, if I can explain a bit, so what we did is train uh, one model on two two instruments at a time. We chose tenor, sax, and trombone because they have similar pitch ranges. And uh, this time we trained it with the Z encoder, which is something they don't really do uh, in the paper exactly the same way. And um, well, uh, as you might have heard, the model does didn't really. Uh, learn two separate instruments but a kind of mashup between the two and when we investigated further we found that it's actually ignoring or it seemed to be ignoring the uh the, the residual features completely so and we were it was just one experiment so we were unable to figure out why this was happening but it's possible that uh training more with more data would help yeah i think that's all for me so yeah, in the line of what Andre already described, uh, we started hacking something towards a uh, multi-instrument timer transfer by not relying on multiple decoders. And we would do this by introducing an instrument classification loss term in the latent code set of the autoencoder. This to promote this entanglement of the timer information as well. And since I've been working lately with GANs in my PhD, we found it interesting to see whether we could apply this DDSP into a, ground, into a gun training setting. Another research direct direction that we identify is extending the library with the missing DDSP blocks uh, targeting other types of synthesis, for instance, in harmonic sounds found in percussive instruments. And last but not least, uh, add some audio processing blocks more oriented towards audio mixing purposes. And that's all. Thank you very much.